I ain't got nobody. Okay. Hold on. Let everybody build up. It's just now starting. That's fine. Just call me. All the day, all the time in the world. Mm -hmm. There they are. Now they're coming on. Good. Nine, ten, thirteen, <clears throat> or twenty. Twenty-one. All right, we'll go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, hey everybody, I just want to go um, let everybody know that some more information came up. Like I said, anybody that knows me, I'm not, I don't stop on this. I work on it every day. I've got, like I said, I've got more time now that my children are at school. And so um, the things I can do now are privately more easier to do without my children, you know, hearing stuff and everything. Um, first of all, I want to let everybody know, can everybody hear me good? Give me a thumbs up or a yes. Not yet. Can you hear me good? Yeah, we're getting some Yeah, I can hear you. All right. Well, um, I got another tape to play tonight um, for everybody. Um, like I said before, um, Everything I find out, everything I learn about my daughter's case, I want to make sure that the community knows because you guys deserve this just as much as I do about my daughter. Well, as I was um, looking through some stuff and put it in my folder, and I wanted, I want everybody to see something. This is um, this is Mackenzie's case right here, and you can tell, like I said, this is what the Fayette County Sheriff's Office should have, just like this. It's laid out nice, got all the information I need towards her case and everything. And uh, I put this together so I can make sure that, you know, I can go back to everything and follow everything real easy. And tonight, uh, earlier today when I was going through some stuff, I have realized I come across those lie detector tests again. So I want to go back to the lie detector tests um, and let everyone know what I found. One of the things I found was that I forgot to read off that night, and probably if I would have, I probably would have caught it. But um, when I looked at Kenny's Mossberger's lie detector test, I have now questions about it. And the reason I have questions about it is because, I want to show everybody this, is because one of the things I noticed was they said that he took his test Exam date was April 27, 2006. And how can somebody be taking a lie detector test when they're still working the investigation and, and, and haven't even ruled it an arson yet or anything in that day? Um, so I want everybody to see an error that BCI made. And BCI's error is, if you can see at the top of it right there, it says April 27, 2006. So now, did Kitty take a polygraph test, or did he not take a polygraph test? And that's a question I have to ask the Fayette County Sheriff's Office and BCI. And another one I, that I um, come across, so when I saw that Kitty took it the same day the fire and the same day my daughter died, which doesn't happen, because, like I said, they wouldn't even know what kind of questions to ask within 24 hours anyways. And one of the things I come across was Mary Ann's lie detector test. And it says that she took hers May 11, 2006. Now, I proved before that Mary Ann went to um, Myrtle Beach after my daughter's funeral, which was around May 5th, May 6th, when she went down to Myrtle Beach. And I'll show my proof of what I'm talking about. Here it says she took her test on May 11th, 2006. Her lie detector test. So now I got to question that one because she was in Myrtle Beach. And the reason that I know she was in Myrtle Beach, and the reason I can prove that she was in Myrtle Beach, is two postcards that she mailed to my kids. 
And the dates on the postcards that she mailed these out in Florence, South Carolina, was May 17th, 2006. And the last time that she mailed one out before she left was May 19th, 2006. And here's the date at the top here stamped by the post office in Florence, South Carolina. So how could she be in Myrtle Beach and be in London taking a polygraph test? And then how could Kenny be at his mom and dad's house and then be at my house on the 27th and be at BCI in London taking a polygraph test? So now I have to question the polygraph test of Marianne and Kenny if they really even took the test. Because the dates that I have doesn't show that there was no way impossible they could be in London, Ohio. At the same time, they're in Myrtle Beach. Somebody saying they're having trouble watching it. It's just one person. Go ahead. Okay. So, um. Tell her to leave and come back. So that makes me question, uh, the BCI now, which I'll be making a phone call to them and asking them. Um, or, A, they sent me a false lie detector test with different dates on it because they didn't want me to see what maybe the mother and the boyfriend failed on the lie detector test. But like I said, um, for everybody, that'll be a question um, to ask. And right here, I'll, I can prove... Um, Right here, like I said, here's Myrtle Beach, 2006, a photograph of him on a motorcycle in May. And the reason I know that it's May, the month of May, is because of one reason. It doesn't say it on their picture. It says Myrtle Beach, 2006. But if you take a magnifying glass and you look at this sign right here in the corner, it says May. The month of May for is when this place is reopening. And they were already open. And it says right there, May, at the top of it. The other thing that I wanted everyone to know, and I think this is a good question for the Fayette County Sheriff's Office. I mentioned it to a couple of my friends and stuff, and I wanted to show everybody here in, uh, in the community. And a question I have is on the Sheriff's Report, I started looking at it, and one of the things I recognized is if you can see right here, there's two charges. One's aggravated arson, the other one's aggravated uh, murder. And um, if everybody knows what aggravated means, aggravated means you made it worse than what it would have been. And But what I don't see on this sheriff's report is that the mother and the boyfriend woke up in the middle of the fire and they're looking for a suspect that's going to be charged with aggravated arson and aggravated murder. Wouldn't there also be on this report, on the sheriff's report, two attempted murder charges? If Marianne and Kenny were actually really, truly sleeping that night, it would have been attempted murder on two other people. And those charges are not on this sheriff's report. So that's a question I need to ask the Fayette County Sheriff's Office with their report is why there's not other charges on there which would have been attempted murder on the other two victims that were in the home. There's one more thing. I gotta find my little note thing. So like I try uh, like I'm explaining to everybody, I uh I try my hardest to go back, and this is why everything of mine's organized. This is why I, I have everything. This is why I can, somebody comes up and asks me, I, I can surely show it to them. And uh, one of the things, uh, like I said, is uh, I'm going to work very hard on my daughter's case. The other thing I wanted to show everybody is today I was fortunate, and uh, I finally received one of my, Requests is that I've asked for, and that is the fire marshal's report. And in the fire marshal report, if you remember the last live feed, or the live feed before that that I played, that everybody got to hear the mothers um, talking on the tape, 
um, she mentions about the smoke detectors. And then I showed that where her sister said there was no smoke detectors in the house. Well, I can tell you right now, the sister was telling the truth. Because if you look right here, um, the fire marshal arrived at the scene at 4.32 in the morning. He actually stayed there and cleared the scene at 4 o'clock in that, that afternoon at 4 p.m. And if you can see right here, it says smoke detectors right here in this one, right here in this block, it says smoke detectors. And if you can read it, it says none. No smoke detectors in this house. So, there was no smoke detectors in that house. So, if my daughter was, was awake, alive, sleeping, she would have heard the smoke detectors, but there wasn't none. But, if you go back two months prior to that time of the fire, the children's services in Fayette County approved the mother's house and said that that house was safe. And like I said, I, I got documents that show that they had no ceilings in their bedroom. They had no bathtub. Um, they had no heaters. Um, they were actually took a torpedo heater and shoved it in the furnace and lit a propane tank in the garage that blew heat through the house. And our nice uh, agency over here um, approved the house. And I just proved right there there was no smoke detectors in the house. And I also know um, the state of Ohio law is that any places that are a rental property, the landlord is responsible to do checks on their property to make sure there's smoke detectors in the house and there's an access upstairs for for um, children and family to be able to get out of the house if there was. And by the fire marshal's report, there wasn't any. Um, so tonight I'm going to play, like I said, I, I, you know, I'm doing Fayette County a favor by doing their job for them. Um, and I want to, I found another witness today, um, of the night of the fire. And, uh, y'all are going to be, this one's going to be really interesting. This one's really going to, um, it's going to make some of y'all say, wow, big time. It did me. Um, it, it, it's another, uh. Hurtful thing to listen to, but like I said, it's it's these people that were actually at this fire that are telling their story that should have been told um, the night the fire happened, or at least that morning after they put the fire out and ruled it an arson. Um, and here, this is another one that's never been interviewed, um, and she'll tell it in, in, in when I play it tonight, the tape, and. Um, it's just devastating that for 10 years, people don't understand. And, and I, I get other people all the time saying, well, why don't you let the authorities, you know, do their job? Well, I'm going to tell you what, 10 years, they ain't done their job. Because if they'd have done their job, they'd have done it right in the beginning. And in the beginning, they'd have interviewed these people. Everybody that that mother knocked on their door should have been interviewed. Everyone that spoke to Marianne that night of the fire, before the fire department got there, they should have brought in, talked to, asked questions, what, you know, what they seen, all this stuff. Because they didn't, this is why this case is so, and I'm going to say it blunt, fucked up. Because they didn't listen and interview these people, and if they would have, I guarantee you, three people be in prison today for McKenzie's death. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to play the tape. Um, I hope, and let me know. Please let me know if you can hear it really good. Make sure we keep the yeah, phone keep going. And uh, if you can, please let me know you can. So I, I can, uh, because I'm going to do another thing where I stop it, explain what I, you know, we were just uh, told by this witness and what and what we hear. And um, I'm going to explain some things as we go through it. Um, like I said, thank you so much, um, everybody that is tuning into this and listening to this. Um, it means a lot to me, so I'm going to go ahead and play. That lid next to you, 
don't remember. It's been so long. Well, I, 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 um, yeah, some of it. I I know you're on my my. I I talked to a gentleman that lived next to you. Um, there on Maple Street that lived yeah. in the the lime green house. Um. Gosh, I don't remember. It's been so long. Well, I, I, yeah. I, I mean, it was his. It was his, him, his wife, and two kids. And oh, yeah. uh-huh. he said that he, he was the one that made the nine one one call, and then he's the one that um yeah um was first woken and then, up, and then and when did at the time too. and then he said when he come outside, when they came outside, she already had walked to your house. Uh mm-hmm. Yep. And. What I'm doing is, I mean, have you ever, have you talked to the, anybody yet? Any investigators? No, no one contacted me. No one. No one. The same thing he said. He said that it's been 11 years, and he's never mm-hmm. been contacted by one investigator on McKenzie's case to tell you know what like, what he saw. He said it all the time, and no one ever contacted me. And now, I. I think it's your your daughter. You have a daughter, or no, it wouldn't be your daughter, and maybe your ex husband's daughter. But it was some uh, girl. Oh well, there was some girl that got on there because she was saying that she knew about the shoes. Where Marion come to you and ask you for a pair of shoes? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she was talking about that and. Now, Keith, I know this has been a long time, man. That's what's sad about this. But can you remember what all, when Marion came to your house, what was said? Yeah. When I worked, I went to the door. Um, yeah, I mean, I still remember most of, most of it pretty clearly. I remember, I don't, I don't remember what time it was, but my ex-husband and I were in bed. And we just kept hearing the banging on the door. Um, so we both went downstairs and opened the door and uh, noticed that the house was on fire. And so we opened the door and uh, both of them at the time were at our door. It was uh, Marianne and whatever his name is, I don't remember. Kenny. Kenny, yeah, I'll have to know that because my current is his name. Um, so I remember she, they didn't act like they were in a hurry or anything. They were banging, but opened the door, they didn't act like they were in a hurry. Um, and she, I noticed she didn't have any shoes on only because she said, do you have any shoes that I could wear? So I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, uh, there's a house across the street that's your house on fire. Are you worried about shoes? All right, right there, um, if you guys heard it. She said that when Marianne and Kenny came to their door and knocked on their door and they came down, Marianne and her and Kenny were, you know, like walking around or whatever. And she said she noticed that Marianne didn't have any shoes on because Marianne asked her for a pair of shoes. Never mention McKenzie. Never mention that her house was on fire. The lady said that she looked past Marianne and saw the house on fire and thought to herself, oh my gosh, your house is on fire. Look behind you and you're here asking for a pair of shoes. The shoes were more important than her own child in that house. We gave them to her and she, she put them on, them on she wanted, um, and uh, my husband at the time went into work. We ran over there, um, and at that time, she, Marianne, went across the street, which used to be Sarah Rittenhouse's house. Right. Um, she ran over there, went inside, and there, she was in there the entire time. I didn't see her anymore after that. She wasn't anywhere to be found. I don't know where he went. <clears throat> well, my husband at the time goes back into our shed, gets a ladder out, unless nobody was doing anything. So he gets the ladder out and he's you know, he's going over there to to get her out. Right. Uh, and I, I have I have goosebumps talking about this. Um, 
so then, you know, people show up, the fire department shows up, and, you know, more and more people are, are out there, and the entire time, I remember not seeing Marianne the entire time, and I fall in my eyes off, because I know Mackenzie's in there, and I just get good thoughts. Right. So I had, you know, my husband at the time was trying to get over there, and, you know, the ladder is up against the house. So that's when the fire department shows up. Right. Um, but again, I didn't see her the entire time. And finally, when the coroner came out and was carrying Mackenzie to, or somebody was carrying her to the squad. Yeah, the fireman that's when, I, that's when I see Marianne come out and she was sitting on the steps and she was crying. But didn't see her at all. And I don't know where he went. No. But I'm sitting here wondering, like, where is he? Where are the parents? What? And I knew you were at work. Right. Um, now, was she crying? I used to work with Amy. Was she crying when she she came to your house and asked for a pair of shoes? No, not that I remember. Did no. she tell you all, hey, my baby's still in there or anything when she came to the house? Um, to be honest with you, I don't remember that. I, I just remember them banging on the door, us looking over to our right, the house being engulfed. And now, at that time before, now that time before the fire, the fire truck got there. How much would you say that house was engulfed? Mm -hmm. That you see. The I team, it was pretty. It was. It was. It wasn't all really on the side that she was on, because. My ex husband's time was able to go over there with the ladder. Uh-huh. It was mainly the left side. Um, I do remember um, a truck or something. Some, I think it was a truck over there. The vehicle was pulled away from the garage. A red truck? I think so. I know the truck. Yeah, it was a beat up truck. And it was sitting in the, in, in the in, it was pulled away from the house? It looked like it was pulled away from the house. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop it right there. Now, I never mentioned anything. I didn't ask her a question about that red truck. As she's telling the story of what she can remember that night, her exact words was she didn't know where Kenny went. And then she remembered when her husband was trying to go down to the house at the ladder that the truck, and that's the key thing here, the truck was pulled away from the house. So right there's a witness that actually saw the truck pulled away from the house. We know that the coroner's report, it said the truck was in the middle of the road with the keys uh, ignition running. And no one, not one single cop takes the truck. That's when the firemen removed it. They're the ones that pushed it. When, excuse me, when they pushed it across the road over into a, to the neighbor across the street's driveway, they, um, should have wrote that truck off and they should have investigated that truck and that truck should have went into investigation too. They should have took that truck with them and they didn't. And here is a witness before the fire department got there that that truck was away from the house. Now, if you remember the other witness that I talked to that lived in the other house said that Kenny stated to him he had to go and move his truck. So now, with the sheriff's office, like I said, I talked to them about the, the truck because I was upset about it. And the, the thing about the truck is they um, are trying to... They're wanting to say that Marianne and Kenny came to the fire. They ain't come to that fire in that truck. They ain't come to that fire in that truck. <laughs> They're the ones that was in that truck that moved it. But uh, then again, why would you say, and you heard her, even the ladies that I'm talking to said, it was a piece of junk. Red piece of junk. And now you got a mother who thinks about shoes are more important than her daughter. You got a boyfriend that thinks his truck is more important than my daughter. This is why you should investigate 
witnesses around a crime scene. And I'm proving it and proving it and proving it over and over that they did. And the funny thing about it is, I just talked to the leading detective that's on this case now that started it four years ago with this case. I just spoke to him yesterday morning and I was telling him about I had witnesses and what they knew and all that. And he said, well, can you give me their names and phone numbers and so I can call them and talk to them? And then the thing that I said to him, directly to him, I said, oh, my gosh, the, the one of the witnesses is on your sheriff report, the 911 caller. And he said, when I gave him the name of that person, he didn't know who I was talking about. Had no clue. So here again, like I keep trying to tell everybody, how are you moving forward with an investigation when well, you don't have shit? The best thing Fayette County Sheriff's Office could do is come down and sit down with me and take my evidence and let me explain who they ought to go and arrest. And I'm not trying to make a joke out of this or anything, but it just shows their ignorance of their negligence of how they handled this case. So I'm going to go ahead and play the tape. About this. Okay. Um, uh, well, I'm going to rewind it because of what she says. The truck over there, the vehicle was pulled away from the garage. A red truck? I think so. I know the truck. Yeah, it's a beat up truck. And it was sitting in the, in, in the, and it was pulled away from the house? It looked like it was pulled away from the house. Okay. I've always had suspicions about this. Okay. Um, I do remember the, the truck being pulled away. Um, and then again, I, oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I, I do remember this. At the time, I did not see Kenny for a long time. And then when I seen the emergency personnel pull up, that's when I had seen him and he was standing out there talking to one of them. I do remember that. He was standing out there talking to someone with his arms crossed and they were just chit-chatting and I remember saying to my husband and I'm just I'm mad at this point I'm like are they going to have to do something about this why is he just standing there I do remember that okay yeah, I, I do remember just looking at him and you know we were freaking out right and my husband's like what is going on and I'm like is he going to do something why is he just standing there why are these people just standing here right now, he, she said that she remembers looking down, down by the, the, where the house was on fire, and Kenny was standing there with his arms crossed like this and talking and carrying a conversation with the firemen that were there to save my daughter's life. But remember, he never told him for 20 minutes that my daughter was in that house. So instead of him being down there as a volunteer fireman, jumping up and down and screaming and letting them know where my daughter was at because he knew which bedroom she was at. He knew where the bed was at. He knew what window that she was at. Instead, he's got his arms crossing and carrying a conversation. I would love to know what that conversation was um, because it surely wasn't about my daughter. And her being trapped in the house upstairs. Um, so like I said, right there, actions speak louder than words. Always remember that. Actions speak louder than words. So, and then she also said earlier in the tape that the mother went into a house and stayed inside that house until they brought my daughter out and down the street. And, man, I don't. It's uh, to me. I'm sorry, but it, it's just sickening. It's sickening to hear that there was so many, much time wasted. And I've always said this: that 20 minutes would have made a big difference. How my baby girl would have came out of that house. Now my daughter could have been still passed away, which I believe she was, but she might not have looked like she did. And what my memories, my last memories of my baby girl are of. And to me, that is sickening of two people 
that knew what fire can do to a human, especially somebody that's a volunteer fireman that knows what fire does to um, a human being, to sit there and hesitate and hesitate and hesitate and knowing what that fire was doing to my baby girl. And I can tell you right now, I don't need the fucking sheriff to tell me this. I don't need the fucking detectives to tell me this. I don't need nobody to fucking tell me this. They wanted my daughter to come out of that house a lot worse than what she did. And it sickens me to even know that they allowed that house and, and to keep burning and burning, knowing also not only my baby girl being in that house and and going through the pain and the suffering that she went through, but they didn't even think about the firemen themselves and their families that watched their dads and mom go out that door knowing they were going to a fire and, and was going to enter a house and try to rescue a child that their own lives were in danger of themselves. And these, these men are my heroes because they risked their life. Even though the way my daughter came out of that house, they risked their lives to try to save my baby girl when two pieces of shit, and that's what they are, pieces of shit stood around and never mentioned anything never said and didn't even have didn't even have the guts didn't even have the guts <coughs> to to even watch what they did their low lives and I, I and they should be sentenced for this and the sheriff's office should do their fucking job if you're not going to do it i guarantee you my followers my community my children, my wife, my friends, and me are going to. And every day I'm going to keep proving that you're dumbasses. You're, you're the dumbest friggin' department I've ever seen in my life that would allow this to go 11 years and not ask one question. I, I mean, not even one question of where's this document or where's this. I mean, I don't know where you went and got your education from. But by God, I surely want, want your teacher to teach me. So I'm going to go ahead and let the tape keep playing because it does still keep going. Um, and it, it, and there's some other details that are very interesting. See, and that, that's, that's, right. See, and that is the thing that when I would talk to other people, they said, you know, she didn't act like, like McKenzie was in there, so nobody at, in the beginning of this even knew my daughter was still in the house because she never mentioned anything until the firemen and then started showing up. And then they, Sorry. And then I know the sheriff said, Vernon Stanford said that he walked over to the porch and that's where he told her because she was sitting on the porch watching and he told her yeah. that McKenzie was dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that. She walked because we watched them carry her body to uh, the England every time I thought about this. I mean, and I still remember this. You know, I know it was so long ago, but I do remember the corner showed up, which was Dr. A, okay? And uh, yes, I do remember she was sitting on the steps on that top, on the top, on the porch. Right. And she was sitting there, and I don't remember who else was sitting up there. And he had walked up and told her that, and then that's when she started crying. And that's when she started crying was after he told her mm -hmm. she was dead. Mm -hmm. Yep. And okay. now, how long would you say after he told her, if you can remember, how long after he told her that she was dead did they stay there at the scene before they left? Uh, you know, to be honest with you, I don't remember because I stayed out there for a little bit. Um, and I remember... Because um, I know the ambulance was there for an hour. Okay, yeah. Yeah, they were. I know they were out there for a while. Um, and I remember, and again, I bring reference to Amy because I worked with her at Pottery Mark. Uh -huh. I remember her, someone had to bring her. I don't remember who brought her. Maybe it was her dad. Um, somebody had picked her up from work, brought her, and I remember her showing up. And then I walked back over to my house, and I was watching out the window. I mean, I was heartbroken. I was devastated. 
Yeah. I've never been in my living room window on the side where we built a deck and just watching out. So I couldn't tell. I didn't really pay attention to her at that point. Um, and I watched it for a little bit and went to bed. And it, I mean, it was probably 3 o'clock in the morning when I went to bed or so. Right. All right, I'm going to stop it right there for a second. Um, I was, when I listened to the tape and I heard this witness that I've never met, um, she said that she was heartbroken. She was crying. And I sit there and I think about it because just like the other gentleman, I talked to the witness and I spoke to his wife who was a witness that came to my, um, my, um, uh, Protest. protest at the sheriff's office and she said that she was crying and stuff I hear all these people crying and everything but the mother did not cry until after they brought Mackenzie out of that house and I sit there and I keep thinking in, in my mind what what why what what would that mean and um, I can tell you what it means um, my daughter came out of that house the way they didn't want her to <laughs> And when they noticed that she came out the way they didn't, that Mackenzie wasn't supposed to come out of that house, they knew that me, she knows me. My ex-wife knows me very well. And she knew I was going to come full blast when I found out that this was a murder. And she knew I was going to ruin her plans. Those tears were not tears of sorrow. Those tears were not that her baby was gone. Those tears were anger because she was going to get caught. And I keep proving it every day and every day that that who was involved in my daughter's death. And you're right, Marianne. You're going to get caught. I told you this back years ago when I talked to you and you, and you told me two different stories, which... I asked about the tapes again to the sheriff's office, and of course, they're still looking for them. Um, when I listened to you tell me the two different stories, and then I, you told me another story, and then you told the regular girl another story, I knew right then there was something wrong. And uh, the only thing you're right about is I am coming after you. I'm coming after you. I'm coming after Kenny. I'm coming after William. And I'm coming out after any... Uh, county official that had their hands in this and didn't do their job. Um, like I said the other night when I talked to everybody, these are basic, basic things you do in all murders. It ain't like I said something, uh, it just started in 2006 that you take photographs and you collect evidence and you talk to witness. This shit started way back when Jesse James was killed. Uh, so that tells me right there alone, uh, there's a reason for everything. Um, I know the sheriff's always gets mad because I call it a cover up, but if you can prove me wrong, and I've asked you to do this, Vernon, if you can prove me wrong, come and prove me wrong. Sit down with me, but I want to do it in front of the public, in front of the community, and I want you to explain to me how this is not a cover up. Explain it to me. I would, we would all love, trust me, to hear it. Your, your excuse of why the things that were supposed to be done didn't get done and weren't handled the right way. Um, but I can guarantee you one thing. I am, like I said this before, I am doing your job for you, not getting paid for it. I saw on here where, um, Emily asked me if I had a lawyer. Um, I do have lawyers that are helping with this, but they're not going to, um, they're not in this state, um, of Ohio. Um, the hard part about a lawyer is as long as Vernon Stanford calls this an ongoing investigation, nobody will touch it. Um, because it's ongoing and there could be more that comes out later and later and later. And I understand that part because just like, uh, you guys see right here every day I'm coming out with more than, I mean, my my folder ain't even that thick. They've got oh I think I think there's probably when BCI came and got their stuff because I was there the day they BCI invited me to while they 
took everything out of Fayette County and took it to London. I'd say there was two vans full of stuff. Uh, of course, no ladder. Um, two vans full of stuff, and I had a leading detective from BCI who eventually retired um, tell me that there was stuff missing and everything else. There was pretty much nothing they could do with this case. Um, and like I, I said before, this is all I've got. One notebook. And I've got enough evidence in this notebook, plus circumstantial evidence, to put three people away. So, honestly, um, to answer your question, too, about a lawyer, you know, um, I've always done everything my own way. I've always fought all my uh, courts by myself. And the reason why is lawyers, don't get me wrong, there's good lawyers, but lawyers don't know me. They don't know McKenzie. They didn't meet McKenzie. And who better off to hear the truth and, and the love and the comfort that you have for a child than their own parents. So um, even if I got a lawyer, the lawyer really don't need to go find nothing. I've already found everything. And I'm finding more. And, and, and like I said, one notebook will explain exactly what happened that night. And uh, like I said, I've got over... I think there's 16 cassette tapes now um, with confessions on it from officials and everything else. So um, a lawyer to me would kind of be a waste. Um, this is probably going to be a case where I just need somebody that's going to show me how to present it. But I think it would be better that I present my daughter her own case because I think that's what Mackenzie's trying to do now is she's trying to show everybody what really happened to her that night and who's involved. So just to answer that, it's nothing against lawyers. There's good lawyers out there. Like I said, there's uh, <coughs> excuse me, good cops, and then there's some cops that don't know their job or shouldn't have a job. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and keep playing the tape. I just wanted to, I saw some an uh, questions on here and stuff. But I can tell you one thing, um, I've said this before, I'm not a dad, I'm a father. And there is a big difference. Anybody can be a dad, but you earn a lot being a father. And you got to know what that word means. And uh, I think I'd do pretty good uh, for all my kids and for Mackenzie. Um, and that's why I believe Mackenzie laid this in my hands, in my lap, because she knew what I would do. And... Uh, my kids always looked up to me. So um, there's a lot of sleepless nights, but I can tell you one thing. In the end of this, the joy will come out of it, and um, I'll be able to sleep and rest better, and so will my daughter. And that's all that matters to me. And, and like I told uh, Ryan at the sheriff's office, your biggest mistake is you're going back to everybody else's notes. And you don't need to do that. You need to start like it happened yesterday. And you need to go and investigate the people and bring the people in and re-question people and re-bring um, in the mother and the boyfriend. And by now, they probably won't come in without a lawyer. But that's what needs to be done. And, and I'm just showing them how to do it, their job. It's not that hard um, to do it. Um, if it is, the only reason it would be hard is because you don't want everybody to know the truth. But I'm a different type of person. Um, I believe in the kids that went to school with her. I believe in, like, this witness here that said that she cried and, and watched out the window and bawled her eyes out over my daughter, you know, over my child. And the mother sitting there watching and never shed a tear until she was told that she was dead. So I'm going to go ahead and play the tape. Thanks, everybody. I don't know if you know who Mike Spiegel is. He was a big deputy. He was a big deputy, big deputy. He weighed almost like, you know, 350, 400 pounds. Yeah. Do you remember him being there at that scene? I'm sorry, he was what? Do you remember him being there at the scene? Honestly, I don't. I know that he lived in the street behind us, but I don't remember if he was there or not. Okay, that's fine. That that's fine. 
I mean, I know, like I said, this has been 11 years, and I know when this first happened, if, if an investigator would have came to you and talked to you, you would have remembered all, you know, what everything pretty much, right. because it was right. fresh in your mind, and like you said, you know, this bothered you. Um, I know, I know, um, in the coroner's report that I had found that they stated that you know, the mother and the boyfriend waited 20 minutes before they even let a fireman know that Mackenzie was in the house. And so they wasted, you know, that time. I know the neighbor next door said that Marianne and King were, you know, they weren't running, like running, to, like, you know, extremely trying to get help. They were more walking, like. Yeah, when they had, when we had basically, I, okay, so when they showed up at the door, she was saying, I noticed the house was on fire, and I looked over and I looked at her, and she said, Her house is on fire. And then the next thing she asked was, Do you have shoes? Right. Not, you have phone, nothing. So my husband at the time called 911. So he called 911 too? He called 911 as well, yes. Okay. And he did talk to somebody. Okay. Well, yeah, I probably dispatched, and they probably, maybe at that time, they probably told them that, you know, your neighbor already had called, and they already had people on their way. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't want to keep it. He called, and... See, I... The, and, then, and we were trying to get out the door to go over there, and she was still standing there. I was just like, um, and I, and I, you know, am I going to beat you over to your own house? And I didn't think that at the time, but I started to think, damn, like, this is so weird to me. Like, what is going on? Why? No, <laughs> no rush. Like, no rush at all. Right. Now, right there on that tape, she said that um, her and her husband were headed over to, you know, to, to the house where the fire was that away, and Marianne just stood there on her porch. And she said to Marianne, Are, am I going to beat you to your own fire see i just i just want people to understand that if an uh, if the right investigator would have been on this case and you gotta think this is someone too 10 years 11 years ago and 11 years you know you can remember some things but you can't remember everything but the 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 heartache of this the heartache of this is that at that time they knew all of it they knew exactly what they seen they knew exactly what everybody was doing that night. And, you know, they're trying, and like this lady here, she keeps saying, you know, I keep getting goosebumps and, and it keeps choking me up. And I understand that, you know, she's reliving it just like I'm reliving it, you know. But the, the grace of God is that McKenzie brought these people to me. She gave me the, the, the power and the strength to find them. And it's sad that I find them in in less than three days. I've already found three, three, four witnesses in three days. And the sheriff's office haven't found none in 11 years. You know, um, so McKenzie brought them to me. And, and like I said, by the, the power and grace of God, uh, she's a wonderful person. My daughter was a wonderful person and she didn't deserve what happened to her. And if I frown on the people that's involved in this, that should have investigated the right way that didn't, I frown on them because this is not about um, anybody else other than Mackenzie Taylor Branham, an eight year old little girl that went to bed that night that's supposed to have dreams and getting up and going to school the next day and that's what she's supposed to have and he took it away from her and now you even took more from her because you didn't even have the heart to go and investigate this the right way um i but i can tell you i do want to say you know i thank the community because you guys are the ones that gives me the strength too and you keep me going, and every time somebody hears something, I, I, I find out about it, I, I look into it, and, and I do what I do. 
And like I was telling you guys the other night where these women got on this page and said, I don't have no job. I do have a job. The job is finding justice for my daughter. And if anybody don't understand that, I, I kiss my ass. But the thing of it is, is um, it's a 24-hour job. Um, I don't know when McKenzie comes to me, puts a thought in my head, tells me to get up, go look in the 9,000 pieces of paper I have, that there's something there and I find it. Um, I can tell you, I've been working on this case, like I said, even the time when my daughter died and I looked at the autopsy report and they said there was no injuries um, on the outside of my daughter. And one day I was sitting there and I had all these photographs on this um, thing that they call it a, uh, uh, what is that called? A massage? Uh, uh, collage. Collage? Collage? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I had all these pictures and McKenzie kept telling me, Dad, look, look at the picture. Look at the picture. Look at the picture. And I couldn't understand what she was saying to me and I was getting mad. <coughs> and I said, man, McKenzie, I don't know what you're saying to me. And she kept saying, look at my picture. And I had all these pictures of her. So there was like 15, 20 pictures and I'm, there's actually a photograph where I show all my kids and we're holding that thing up with all my daughter's pictures on it. And the picture um, that my daughter was telling me to look at was actually her school picture. And the reason that she was telling me to look at her school picture, and it's hard to see it on this one because I don't, it's a small picture, but it's her school picture that, that she was telling me to look at. And I kept looking at it and looking at it. And she said, Dad, you're not looking in the right spot. And when I looked at it, right here on her wrist, and I don't have, like I said, if I get a bigger picture on her wrist, there's bruises around her wrist. And on her arm was a cut about six inches long down her arm. And I took it and I, I took the picture and I ran over to the sheriff's office. I mean, like immediately. And then they took it and... They went to downtown photos and they had it blown up to the biggest they could get a picture blown up and they saw the mark on her arm and on her wrist. Now on her wrist, I can understand them not seeing that kind of injury because her hands and her wrist were black from the fire, but her arm was still her arm color and uh, there's that big long cut on her arm and bruises on her wrist and no one knew it. No one knew by looking at that photograph, and uh, never went any further. They never asked the mother why, you know, and the thing about that picture is why McKenzie wanted me to see it was this picture was actually taken the day of the fire. It was taken that morning at school, and then she died that night. So I thought that was pretty interesting of what my daughter was trying to tell me uh, what to look for. And I saw it, and I passed it on to the fire or the uh, sheriff's office. But as you can tell, it didn't go nowhere. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and play tape. Where a mother with her child in the house. First of all, you wouldn't leave your house anyways. But second of all, you would be trying to get everybody you can to go help get my daughter out of the house. Exactly, John. I'll be honest with you. As a mother, a two, I would never, ever, ever leave my children in a burning house, I will burn in their window. I will never leave right. my children in a burning house. Ever. Well, I can tell you one thing. Um, I've already talked to the other person, your neighbor, and and I'm, like I said, I'm tracking everybody down that I can get and that's never talked to an investigator, never had a conversation with anybody about what they seen, what how the mom reacted, how the boyfriend reacted. You know, because those are key things to this, to, you know, because the detectives and them, they're not there yet. They don't know yet it was an arson either. They All they knew was a fire. So, you know, you would think as soon as it was ruled an arson, the first thing they would do is contact everybody was outside that saw this. Everybody, her hand touched their door, and she woke them up, would have been, you know, notified and, and brought in and said, hey, you know, what do you remember that night? You know, da-da-da-da. But, you know... Like even the gentleman I talked to, he said, you know, I can remember quite a bit, but 11 years, I can't, you know, it's hard to remember everything, but if they came, he said, the only thing that bothered me was as soon as they ruled this arson, I never understood why, no one contacted me. Right, and that's what I thought too, and I even told my 
husband now, I'm just like, no one's ever, because he lived in uh, Jacksonville at the time, and I, I mean, I didn't know him then, but yeah. I asked him if he remembered that, and I'm like, yes, I remember, and I told him the story, and nobody's ever contacted me, ever. Wow. Well, like I said, I'm working hard on Okay, now right there you heard her say she has never, ever been contacted. No investigators, no cop, no detective, nobody. And here, I mean, you heard already parts of what this lady's already seen, what she saw that night, what she heard that night, what the mother asked for, and never been investigated. Going on 12 years. Very hard on this to prove yeah, some prove some things that ain't going the way it should have went, and the way you're supposed to investigate, you know, a homicide. And um, yeah. and I'm not going to give up on this. I I appreciate you know because even like that guy next door to you, like he said, I asked him. I said, "What was King wearing?" He said, "He didn't have no shoes on, but he had blue jeans on. He didn't have a shirt on, but he had a black yeah, dress." I didn't have a shirt on. He said, but he had a black trench coat on that covered him. But when it when it would open up, you know, you could see that he didn't have a shirt on. And he said, I can't remember Mary Ann, but I know she was dressed. I just can't remember what she had on. Yeah, I don't remember what she was wearing. And then he said, um, and the dog was with them. The dog? Yeah, the black dog. He said a black dog? Yeah. I don't remember, to be honest Kitty's with you. black dog. He had a black dog. Black lamb. But that was before me. I, I do think he had a cell phone on him because I, I, I think he was in the phone with somebody. And I was thinking, why didn't you call the police or the fire department? Why? I, I think he had a cell phone on him. Yeah. Now, right there. I hope every one of y'all heard what I just heard. Dang. Her exact words was, he had a cell phone on him, mm. and the boyfriend did, and he was on it, and she asked her husband, why is he not calling the cops or the fire um, department or 911? And she's pretty for sure, without a doubt, he had a cell phone on him, and he was on it. Talking on a cell phone. Now, I can tell you who he was talking to, but that's another story here. But I can give you a little hint. I guarantee you who he was talking to works for the Fayette County Sheriff's Office. And I guarantee you it wasn't the, the 911 call. So here's this guy who's a fireman. Not only... I already knew there was a phone on the firehouse, so he could have ran down there and got on that phone and picked it up, dialed 911. The mother goes to a house, never asks for a phone, goes to another house, never asks for a phone, but asks for tennis shoes. Her cell phone's in the red pickup truck. He's got a phone and never called. So why are you, if you have a cell phone, think about this. If you have a cell phone, why are you running... You should have been at the house trying to get my daughter out on the phone with 911. Not up the street knocking on doors to ask somebody to call 911. But they didn't even ask somebody to call 911. And then he has a cell and he's on, a, he's on the phone carrying a conversation while my daughter is burning inside of a house. Are you fucking kidding me? Kenny Mossberger, you're a piece of shit. You're a piece of shit. And I, God, I wish I could just face you one-on-one, -on -one, buddy. I wish they would put you in front of me. I eat, ugh. Got a cell phone and never makes, never calls 911. I don't care what anybody says. They wanted my daughter not to come out of the house. They wanted my daughter to die. And my daughter suffered. And my daughter passed away. For greed of two fucking people. Greed. That not only didn't care about my daughter, but didn't care about the firemen, didn't care about, hell, they didn't even care about the people that went in the house.
that knew after they put the fire out and the fire, the structure of the house was unsafe, that they had to go and try to collect what they could. Shit, they had no heart. No heart whatsoever for these, for these heroes. They have no heart for my daughter. And for that son of a bitch to put my daughter's face tattooed on his chest and say, in honor of my daughter, buddy, I, oh my God, man. It's, it's a good thing that my daughter sits right here on this shoulder and pats on me every day and tells me, that's not the way it needs to be done, Dad. That's not the way it needs to be done. Because I'm going to tell you right now, your time's coming. And the community is sick of it. And like I said, it, it's, it's so heartbreaking to know that this sheriff's office don't even know this kind of evidence. And two people are breathing my fucking air. They're breathing my air. That's how I look at it. You're breathing my air. You had a fucking cell phone and you're more concerned talking to somebody on that. Probably who you was talking to was your fucking mom and dad that lived in Bookwater and asking them to bring clothes because there is a witness that puts you inside the house changing your clothes because you probably didn't want anybody to smell the accelerant on your ass. But I'm going to tell you what. Fayette County, you fucked me. You fucked up. But my daughter and God are a lot stronger and a lot powerful than you are. And we're going to solve this, baby doll. We're going to solve this. Fayette County, your ass belongs to me. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think that he was... And he was on the phone? Talking to someone. Yeah. Talking on the phone. Okay. No, that's fine. I mean, I know this is hard for you, and I know, I know it, it's, it's, um, um, it's, like I said, it's my daughter, and I just want to make no, sure just, justice is done the right way. That's just ridiculous that nobody's investigated that. Ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's sad that you have to do it yourself. Well, I can promise you one thing. I got your phone number now. I will keep it if you don't mind. And Absolutely. If they need, I will. If they need anything, if they need to bring me up the questioning, I am more than want to do it. Well, what I was going to say is, I will get a hold of you, but like I told. Um... All right, everybody. So that's pretty much the tape. I was just telling her that uh, what I told the other witness that uh, I ain't giving Fayette County shit. Um, I will find the person I trust to handle my daughter's case the right way. And then that's the that's the person that will get these witnesses' names and phone numbers. Uh, you had your chance. You you had a chance eleven years ago, and you fucked it up. And uh, uh, so uh, it's like I said. Even after she tells me about Kenny and the cell phone and him on the phone and stuff, you know, she said that she was sorry. And I can tell you right now, she has no reason to be sorry um, at all. Uh, what she's doing now and what they wanted to do 11 years ago was to tell somebody what they saw and seen, but nobody uh, wanted to contact them and ask them what happened. So, I mean, to me, they did everything they, they could do. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me where you go from here and uh, the, the where I go from here is I don't stop. And, uh, I keep going because I believe there's still somebody out there. I still believe there's somebody that 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 seen more, and um, it's getting really good um, that it's coming out the way it's coming out. And uh, I'm proud of myself. I can tell you that right now. My wife tells me she's proud of me. Um, I'm proud of myself. My friends tell me they're proud of me. Uh, I still have my haters out there that still believe that, you know, the sheriff's office is doing all they can, but, um, they're not in the, um, what is that? The army Marine Corps do all you can, um, all you can be. the all you can be, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I can tell you one thing, um, to my haters, you'll never tear me down. You'll never break me. Um, I'm a strong person. 
I have a big heart and uh I just um been talking to somebody else that had, you know that has the same issue going on. Um I just helped uh a good friend of mine today um gave her how to uh gave her some help in trying to find her daughter that's been missing for three days. And uh I'll keep doing it. Um if I can help anybody with something that they feel that ain't right or whatever, I, I'll promise you I'll help you. Um, I can't charge you. I'm not an investigator, so I can't charge you. And these haters out here, that's the first thing they're going to get on there and say, well, you need to turn that into IRS. Uh, I, I can say one thing. I love everybody. Like I said, every time I say this all the time, I love everybody. I love you guys. I love every time you guys follow me. And you, there's people out there that direct me the same way. There's people that's real close to my heart that ask me questions all the time. Um, and I love the questions because it, sometimes I sit there and I think about that question and, and I say to myself, man, you know, um, man, I need to look into this. And there's one particular person and uh, she knows who she is. Uh, she's got a picture of her white poodle. Um, she, she keeps it going. Um, She's a big part of this, and I appreciate everything she's done. And um, there's other ones on the Justice for uh, Murder, Mackenzie Taylor Branham, the site that I that a, a few ladies uh, started up for me and stuff. And it's really interesting because everything that I do and everything's on that site. So if you miss something, whatever, you can go on there. And it's called Justice for Murder, Mackenzie Taylor Branham, and. Uh, it's very interesting. It's got everything, like I said, on there and stuff and what we want to do and stuff and, and everything. And, uh, right now I'll, I'll take the time because I've never done this for a while. But if anybody has any questions they want to ask me, um, go ahead and ask. And I got somebody here that can read them to me and then I can answer anybody's question. Um, but before you ask any questions, I would love for one thing, Mackenzie loves this, but if you can, uh, shoot some hearts across the screen for her and let her know that you guys care uh, for her. They've been doing it for past 20 minutes. And uh, so if there's any questions, go ahead and uh, you can ask me and I'll answer the best thing I can answer. Hey, it's been up in the hearts for about 20 minutes. See you through the heart. Okay, well, like I said, I'm going to talk a little bit more, and then if you got any questions, just pop them in there. Um, like I said, uh, this is a, a witness that also, you heard her at the end of, the, of it, she said that she said that uh, anybody wanted to ever talk to her, she would come in and give her statement and everything. Um, I did request some things. I'm gonna let people know what I did request. I did request some DNA. I gave some names of who I wanted DNA taken from. I also requested for the mother, the boyfriend, and the brother to be brought in and read another lie detector test. I won't. Add, I won't tell you guys what the questions I wanted them to be asked. Um, because I want to give them heads up. Because I always know some some of them watch and and see you know what I'm doing. But I want her to watch. I want her to know that I'm coming and I am so close to getting her where I, where she needs to be. And, uh, so I don't care who is friends with her and they share with her. I want her to, I, you don't know. It, it's so important for me to let her know what I'm doing because damn, if she's going to do anything, I can guarantee you that. Um, but, uh, all I can say is I'm going to keep working on this. Um, I know there's other people out there that that are that seen stuff, know stuff. Um, I just talked to another witness. Um, actually, they saw me working and 
and stopped and talked to me and they seen some things and uh, I won't go into those things because and I know that'll give that person away to to uh, that other side of the fence. Um, I am going to still do the live feed in Tip City. I just got to figure out a day when I'm going to do it. Um, try to catch her um, and see if she wants to answer any questions. Pretty much we know it's all going to be lies anyways. Um, whatever comes out of her mouth is a lie. But back to like the uh, polygraph test. Uh, BCI you screwed up too. You need to explain why your dates don't match the dates of where they were. So um, I want to know that answer. I want to know if they really did take a polygraph test. Um, we got a couple questions. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I back to is Jesse Weed prosecuting it? Is one of them. Jesse Weed is prosecuting this. Um, I can tell you one thing about Jesse Weed. He talks to me pretty much every every other day, or I'm at his office and we talk. He's the one that requested a lot of the stuff. Um, so far, everything he's pretty much requested, he's done for me and made sure I got. Um, I haven't yet talked to Jesse, but there's uh, a couple questions I need to ask him that I just found out about some other things. Um, I'm waiting on those reports to come. Um, like I said, I just got in the mail the fire marshal's report. Um, I requested it through the fire marshal. They turned me down the first time. Second time, um, I kind of threw a little sideball at them and I got what I wanted. Um, the only one left uh, that I haven't got is ATF. But yes, Jesse Weed is the prosecutor on this. And we've already discussed um, three different ways that we could take this case and deal with this case. And my opinion, the best way that I feel that they should take this case is they ought to go ahead and charge with the arson and go with the circumstantial evidence because the difference between circumstantial evidence and solid evidence is solid evidence. If you stab somebody and they've got the knife, that's pretty much, they show the knife in, in there to the jury. They show the stab wound and it's over with. With circumstantial evidence, they actually get to tell a story. They, they tell the story of why they believe this was used or this was done. And I believe, I don't believe in God's creation of this earth. There would be one jury that I would feel that somebody on that jury would sit there after these witnesses say the mother sat on a curb, never said anything about her daughter. She asked about shoes. She sat on the porch and watched the fire. Um, I don't think there's anybody on a jury that was not convict her. Uh, she didn't act like a mother. Um, She's not even a mother. Um, I always call her, I always have a nickname for her, me and the fire marshal do, and we actually call her the Black Widow. Um, and honestly, that's what she is. Uh, because one thing about her, too, is she'll bring other people in that know nothing about this case to do her dirty work to try to slander me and and bring up about my past and my history and da-da-da-da-da. And then that person is the one that is in her web and then they're the ones that I go after and say well wait a minute you don't know what you're talking about here's my evidence you're stupid you're dumb why did you even get involved so that's why we nicknamed her the black widow because she always gets everybody else to do her dirty work just like she got a page and told that page that she was going to tell her story <coughs> and never did and then turn around and like I said I had to take one of her can one of her stories, and we got to hear her story. And in that story, she told in 10 minutes, I think it was like three or four lies in 10 minutes. So, um, like I said, that's that's pretty much with Jesse Weed. Have you been in contact with an attorney general for a private investigation? Okay, with the state's attorney general's office, um, I guess you didn't hear me the other night, and I'll say it again because I like saying it. Mike DeWine, kiss my ass. You're a piece of shit. Um, I've called his agency five times. They have ignored me five times. Um, and if you ever call the state attorney general's office and you pick up the phone, you'll hear Mike DeWine get on there and, he, and his first 
his little story is that he uh, is for victims, families, you know, and this and, and that kind of stuff. And here, here I am a victim. Here it is. My daughter was murdered and he's ignored me five phone calls. And you got to remember one thing. I hate saying this, but he is running for governor and you can guarantee you my, I ain't vote for him. I'll vote. I don't give a damn whose name's on that paper below his. That's who I'll check. I will not vote for him. State's Attorney General's office, like I said, I've contacted them five times. They even got mad at me for calling too many times and actually uh, hung up on me. So this is what I've got to say about Mike Dwight. Kiss my ass. Um, so that's pretty much answers that question. Uh, do you think the sheriff's office is not doing much because Kenny was part of the fire department? Um, I don't think the sheriff's office is doing much about it. Not because Kenny is was a fireman. Um, because honestly, he wasn't a fireman. He was a coward that wore a, uh, a suit. Um, I'll put it that way. Because any other true fireman, um, if they weren't on duty or not, I guarantee you they'd have went in there and tried to save my baby. They would not have waited uh, for anybody else to show up. That's a true fireman. Um, a fireman has an oath. And they always live by that oath. And to me, he wasn't a fireman. So, no, I don't believe that's why. Um, I haven't really got to pinpoint it to why. I believe the sheriff is doing what he's doing. I've made some accusations, and pretty much they got pissed about it. Uh, I'm going to say that the male DNA that was in my daughter's room is related to somebody on the boyfriend's side of the family. And because a certain person got involved that shouldn't have got involved, um, that's why I believe that they're handling the case like they did. Um, when are you expecting answers from the exhuming and what testing were being done? Okay, the exhuming of McKenzie, um, I'm hoping that it should be back by October. But I did find out something the other day. And what I found out the other day is... Montgomery County came here and did their, um, the exhume here. They didn't take her to Montgomery County. Um, so I found that out. And where they did the exhuming, I believe there's going to be some conflict there. And for the sheriff's office, I hope not because that's another foot in their ass by me. Um, but it, the samples, they said anywhere from the time they took them until six months, usually no longer than a year. Um, when I talked to Montgomery County, and they're the ones that actually did the samples that they took from my daughter, um, said if, if they would have went to Montgomery County, they would have had the samples back in three to four weeks. Because the sheriff and the detective took the samples to London BCI, we're on a waiting list. And the reason that happened is because they would have had to pay Montgomery County to do the samples and get what they needed and then give the results. Where BCI, it was free. That's the God's honest truth. It was about money. And right there again, it shows you McKenzie is not a number one priority. It was about money. So now we're waiting and these, these people are walking the streets free of a murder while we're waiting on test results that would have already been back. Actually, they would have already been back because they exhumed her on June the 20th. So in three to four weeks, by July 20th, they'd have had the samples and everything. They'd have had what they were looking for already back. So that's another, you know, stab in my back. But it's also a mistake by them that helps me later on down the road. Have they said anything about re-questioning, bringing them in for re-questioning? Yes, they did, uh, they did mention about bringing the three back in and re-questioning them. But here's the thing about re-questioning somebody. You got to have witnesses that you talk to. You got to have a folder that looks like this. You got to have a way to ask the questions you need to ask so when they're lying, you can punch holes in them. So, without this, it wouldn't do them a damn bit of good to bring them in. Um, honestly, it wouldn't. Um, unless they bring me in and ask them the questions, that would be the best way. 
uh, let me do the interrogation. I would love that, but that's not going to happen either. So when the sheriff's office decides that they want to sit down with me and go through this folder here and, and get the, uh, the evidence they need, then, then they can move forward with bringing them in and questioning them. Why do you think they wanted her to die? What was the reason? Um, I brought, believe they brought up life insurance. Is there life insurance? There was no life insurance, or to so it wasn't life. money. Um, I believe my daughter. Okay, I want to explain this the right way. They found male DNA in my daughter's room. I believe my daughter was being messed messed with, and I believe my daughter knew who it was, and she was going to tell me. And I believe that person was somebody that the mother did not want me to find out. And um, there's two things to this. If if the DML DNA matches somebody under the age of 18, is considered molestation because it's it's two kids at the same age that are experimenting, they would say would be experimenting. If it's somebody over the age of 18, then it would be rape. And um, that's why we're waiting on to see who hits the DNA. Um, but I did find out one thing. I did request one thing, too. And I requested they take my daughter's DNA that they better have. I hope they have still. Um, and they take her DNA and they match it with the DNA that they found. Because there is a test that they can do that will show if it was a relative. They don't need that relative's DNA. All they need is McKenzie's DNA and the DNA that they found at the crime scene and run McKenzie's DNA with it to see if a relative was involved. If it comes back that a relative was involved, I guarantee I can tell you who it was. If, if not, then we have somebody else. And I, and I believe that DNA is probably somebody on Kenny's side of the family that they're trying to not let out of the bag what happened. Come on, Mitchell State Court. Like State, State Court. Court. Supreme Court? Supreme Court type thing. Uh, I'll put it this way. Supreme Court, kiss my ass. Because I I've, I've, uh, wrote letters to them. Um, back when I wanted David Bender removed off my daughter's case because he was my ex-wife's um, lawyer, and he was also the leading prosecutor on McKenzie's case. And I wrote him a letter, and then all I kept getting back was they wanted me to rewrite it. They wanted me. It was over and over. I think I wrote like three letters, and I finally told him, kiss my ass. And um, that's pretty much what I think about the Supreme Court. Uh what did the autopsy say about her lungs? The autopsy about her lungs. It said that I can read it for you real quick. See, this is what's good right here. This is how you investigate a homicide. I can go right to a page with a question and then find an answer for you. Okay. Okay, the respiratory system. The right and the left lungs weigh 305 and 250 grams, respectively. The upper and the lower airways are patent, and the muco mucosal surfaces are smooth and pink, tan, and contain soot, as described. The pearl surface are smooth, glistening, and unmarkable. The lungs and the hiller nodes are mildly and anthracotic. The pulmonary uh, pitchima is dark red purple, congested, excused a large volume of clear, frothy fluid with light finger pressure. The pulmonary arteries are normal, developed, and patent. Now, the question I have about this autopsy, which it's going to, when I, I'm waiting on a few things, and when I get those few things, I'll explain this toxicology report really good. But if you listen in here, it said it had soot in her lung, but then the mucus that was inside the lungs, the mucus that was coming out of her nose was clear. You, you, you're almost contradicting yourself because how could you have soot, which is black? Soot is black. 
and it's dark and it's thick and it weighs. If it's sitting on you and then you cough it and you spit, you're going to have, your mucus is going to be black. So I don't understand how the mucus out of her nose and in her lungs is clear and everything's normal and unmarkable, you know, has no, you know, there's no damage, but they find soot in there. So it's another one of these where I've got a question, the coroner at Montgomery County, of why you're contradicting yourself on certain things in this. Um, are they testing for the actual cause of death instead of due to fire? Um, what they are, what they were testing for, I can tell you what they got from the exhuming was they, I guess what happened was somehow, some way, it doesn't surprise me, but they didn't do a pathology exam on McKenzie. When McKenzie was took into Montgomery County, it went in as an accidental fire. And it shouldn't have never went in that way. And I've got record of that. And when it went in as an accidental fire, they just did a standard uh, toxicology, you know, summary on her instead of what they should have done with a full-blown exam. Um, the reason I know this is because they didn't take photographs of her without her clothes and they didn't take photographs of the clothes. They didn't take photographs of any injuries because if they would have, they would have known the mark on her arm. Um, so when they came back to do this one, they took samples from underneath her nails. They took samples, skin samples, and they, um, I think there was a bone specialist there because when my daughter died, I got a phone call and they asked me if I wanted them to break my daughter's bones so that they could put her in the casket the right way. And I told them no. I said, my daughter suffered enough. I'm not, I don't want her bones broke. So my daughter actually was left the way that she was found dead. And it was probably a great thing that I did that because they do have pathologists that can go in and look at just the body of how the body is, you know, formed and everything and can tell you what she was doing up until her last um, hours of the uh, fire and everything. You ever thought about a wrongful death lawsuit? Have I ever thought about a wrongful death lawsuit? It might, well, it might jump start the investigation. I thought about doing a wrongful death lawsuit, but like I said, you got to have a lawyer to do that. And right now, no lawyer wants to touch this because it is an ongoing investigation, per se, Vernon Stanford. I can guarantee you this is not an ongoing investigation with the Fayette County Sheriff's Office, but it is an ongoing investigation with Donald R. Branham, the father of McKenzie. So, have I thought about a wrongful death lawsuit? Yes, I have. Um, sometimes I believe that by going in and doing a wrongful death lawsuit, you get to, you don't have to have without a doubt, you know, in a wrongful death lawsuit. All you got to do is prove a point. And in that, proving that point, I would be able to show what I've got and everything else. And I believe out of the wrongful death lawsuit, it would end up being a conviction that would put them away. Um, I've asked um, uh, the sheriff's office and them about that too, and I was told, and this is no lie, I was told to bite my tongue for a while and let them do their job. Well, you can see I'm tired of biting my tongue. Can they test for Benadryl or melatonin? No. And here's why they can't test for Benadryl. Benadryl actually leaves your body 35 hours after you it goes into your system. If when they took her to Fayette County Hospital, they don't draw blood from her, which I don't understand why Dr. Gay didn't. But if he'd have drawn blood from McKenzie, they would have been able to determine if she had Benadryl in her, in her system the night of that fire or the other drug you mentioned. Um, because of that, um, not doing that, and then the mix-up, because what happened was my daughter actually went to Montgomery County. Then... They loaded her back up and sent her back out of Montgomery County, back to Fayette County. And on their way back to Fayette County with my daughter is when they got the phone call and said, bring her back. This is now a homicide arson. And they took her back. So with all that time and everything, no. They 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 screwed up in the beginning. Uh, that was the last one so far. That was the last one so far. 
So I, I want to say I thank you, everybody, that, that watched this. I appreciate everybody's comments. I love every one of you guys. Mackenzie loves everybody that is supporting this and behind me on this. Um, like I said, we got haters. Haters are going to be haters. I could care less about them. They can kiss my ass, too. Um, the bottom line is this is about Mackenzie. Mackenzie's what's important. And we need to learn from what happened to my daughter. And that's what my daughter wants. My daughter wants to make sure this never happens again to another child. Um, I don't believe in, in talking with mediums. I, I finally did one. And that medium told me that my daughter was up, up in heaven. And she had a group of kids around her that the same thing happened to them. They were murdered or they were, you know taken away, and my daughter's with them, and the medium said that the, that the children that were with my daughter are proud of what she's doing, and proud of what her daddy's doing, that they look up to me. Speak, um, of, speak of the medium, they just asked to say, yeah, she ever told you about the red truck? The what? The red truck. They watched a video from the other Oh, night. yeah. Um, no, we haven't gotten back on that, on, on the red truck. When I asked her that question, um, but I've got two witnesses that pretty much explains about the red truck um, and who was in that red truck, and they weren't coming to the fire. So um, that's actually a question for Vernon P. Stanford, and I haven't yet figured out what the P stood for. Now my term would be uncalled for for me to say live, but. That would be a question for Vernon P. Stanford. <laughs> Do you ever get any paperwork from Montgomery County? Not yet. Um, still battling that. Crystal ass. So I don't know if you yeah, know. still battling that. Still, um, there's some, um, whether I'm allowed to have it, not allowed to have it. Um, I know the truth behind it now. I did explain that to the leading detective, that, that I know now the truth of what happened in Montgomery County, which... I'll explain to everybody at a later day, probably in a couple weeks or maybe less. Um, there's a lot of truth behind that, and once you hear that, you'll understand why um, there's a battle of what I'm allowed to have and not allowed to have. I'm still waiting on the letter to determine who's who signed the um, for the clothes to be destroyed. Um, but I was told by a person in 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 that kind of the field. And they told me that they believe um, there was no sign letter. They believe that it was um, a phone call. It was over the phone, which is illegal in the state of Ohio. There, that means there was no report. There was no signature. And if that happened, um, shame on you, Montgomery County. Somebody said they're confused about the red truck. Apparently, they don't know about it. Okay, um, the person that's saying they're confused about the red truck. Was Amanda. The red truck is important in this case because in the coroner's report, that was never filed that I found through a good-hearted person. Um, the red truck was sitting in the middle of the road in front of their house with the doors open, the truck was running, and the mother's cell phone was on the front seat. And, and that's why this witness here makes sense. If Kenny was the one that was in that truck, and then later on she seen him on the phone talking, guess he was with her cell phone. And I know the mother had her cell phone, and what explains about the cell phone is, the reason I know the mother had a cell phone was, the day that they brought her in, she two-wayed me. The mother did. And the only way for her to two-way me is, to, is that, you know, they're weird how they had like two numbers, a star, three numbers, a star, and then three numbers, or two numbers again. And you actually, it wasn't like a, a regular phone number to two-way. So it was like a hard number to remember everybody's two-way numbers. So you had a program. And when she two-wayed me, because if her phone would have burned up in the fire, which I thought in the beginning it did, she wouldn't have been able to two-way me when she bought a new phone. She would have had to got me, got me to give her my, look up my two-way number and give it to her and program it in her phone. But she two-wayed me, and I called Vernon about that, and I told him about how in the world is she two-wayed me on her cell phone. But then 
<laughs> the truth came out that her phone didn't burn up and the fire was in the truck, which I believe is the same cell phone that Kenny had. And here he is in a truck, moving a truck, has a cell phone, never calls 911. But they go knock on, waste 25 minutes knocking on doors and waking people up. Um, the red truck is important because, like I said, the mom and the boyfriend's original story is they woke up in the middle of a fire to popping and crackling noises. Um, I don't know how the mom left. She's, I mean, she's got three bodies that went out three different ways. But if you woke up in the middle of a fire and then you're going out the back of the house and you're taking time to put a ladder up against the house and everything, then who the hell was in your red pickup truck that belongs to you that was sitting in the middle of the road running with both doors open? Open. So that's why the truck is important. Because right. somebody was in that truck. We're caught up again. You mean the mother's cell phone was on the seat, but neither one of them could pick up the phone and call 911? Right. The cell, her cell phone was in the pickup truck on the front seat. All right, we're caught up again. So, like I said, everybody, um, I, I, like I said, I love everybody. You guys are the ones that give me the strength. I'm, I, I'm here to make changes. I got the voice, and I'm here to make changes in this community um, for our kids. Our children is what matters. And no one wants to bury their, their child, um, even to an accidental death. And so when your child, you're told your child was murdered, it's even a little harder uh, on you because you know that some vicious person actually took your child's life and their last breath. And um, I apologize. I slip up sometimes and call Marianne mother, and I know that's a bad word for her. She's not a mother. Um, witnesses can prove that. You got a stranger that was more concerned about my child in a house that was burning and was crying and hysterical and still can't even hardly talk about it. And you got a mother that gives a rat's ass what, what happens um, and didn't care that night and didn't cry or scream or anything. So um, the word mother for her is not not the right word. I slip up, so I apologize for that. I always see a lot of people make comments that she ain't a mother, and I don't mean to call her that. Uh, I could call her worse, but that I'm not going to. Um, Did that woman say that her husband put the ladder on the house? Her husband put his ladder on the house? Yes. Didn't this lady just say her husband yes. put his ladder on the house? Yes. And actually where he put the ladder at, was actually where we were, I mean, you had to go back to my life piece, where I was talking about there was a, like an alley thing there um, that went to somebody's garage that was behind her house. And where I was talking about that, if Kenny would not have put a ladder on the back of the house, instead of putting it on the side of the house where there was no fire, which that girl explained, there was no fire on that side of the house. And it, and when he put his ladder up there, she said that's when the fire department then were showing up and everything. And um, so that's, I believe, is what she was trying to explain. But Kenny also had a ladder on there, and he tried to say he already went up the ladder, went in the window, broke the window out, went in the window, tried to save my daughter. Well, first of all, it was a wooden ladder. Second of all, the wooden ladder didn't even reach the window. Third of all, the ladder was broke. And fourth of all, um, the ladder is no longer in evidence. It's missing. Somebody has to, still has contact with their other children? No. Um, actually, when I started this case, um, really getting in, in what I've been doing here, when I started in 2017 with my daughter's year, the mother actually um, blocked her boys completely so they couldn't see her Facebook page or have anything. Um, I know a couple years ago, I tried to let her, you know, talk to the boys because the courts said that she had that right. She just couldn't be, she wasn't allowed around my children. Um, they weren't allowed to go to her house. She had to see them through a visitation center. She didn't want to do that, so she canceled that. Then she had to see them through a psychologist. She went to, I uh, think, about six meetings, and then she came in and said she was done. 
doesn't want to talk to my kids there anymore. But uh, she blocked my kids. She hasn't seen the boys in now, I'd say, two years. Um, and just right before that, she actually showed up in my house, in front of my house, called the police, and tried to have my oldest son, Harrison, arrested. That's the God's honest truth. She mailed them cell phones through the mail so that she could communicate with them because she wasn't allowed to see them physically of us at a visit, you know, supervised. Um, my son didn't want to talk to her no more. And so she cut his phone off and then called the police, showed up in my house and tried to have my son arrested for stealing a phone that he never stole. And of course, they sent a dumbass cop to my house. He was dumb. And he thought he knew the law, and he'd come up, and he tried to tell my son he was going to arrest him. And I asked what was his charge, and he said theft of a phone. And I said, uh, that was a gift, and you need to learn your laws. And um, and uh, because that's a civil matter, if she wants the phone back, she can go to court, and the judge can decide whether my son had to give the phone back or not. And then I asked the cop where he went and got his degree, and he was pretty much done talking to me, walked out of the driveway, told her to leave, and he left. So why it's not autopsies. About so what? were there two autopsies in the beginning? After they took her back to Montgomery County the second time? No. There was actually the one? first one, the first aut the first time she went to Montgomery County, they didn't touch her. Um they actually loaded her back up at nine nine fifty two. They loaded her back up. And, and and she was still in the clothes. She was still in her, um, the t-shirt, the underwear, and the socks. And she was on her way back. It was when they when he got the call, Morrow's funeral home got the call, and he didn't even he wasn't even in Fayette County yet. He turned around and took her back to Montgomery County, and then that's when they uh, took photographs, and then that's when they started the autopsy. All right, we're caught up again. Somebody did ask how many children you have with her. I have a total of three three children with her. And uh, not what Joy Stanford says. <laughs> Joy Stanford said I have four. Unless Marianne's hiding one of my children, um, I have three. I have two boys and then Mackenzie. And uh, I've had uh, custody of all three of my children. I got custody of them in 2004. And I've had my boys since 2004 till today. Um, my daughter, um, went and stayed with her mom on January 5th, 2006 and was murdered April 27, 2006. Um, and that was an agreement with me to allow my daughter to go stay with her mother. Was a rape kit, uh, was a rape kit done? No. And that was another thing. No rape kit was done on McKenzie. That was another mistake. All right, we're caught up. Any more? Any viewers? How many viewers? That's 54. Yeah, I so, um, if there's anything else, like I said, um, I'll be doing another live feed. Uh, the best one I'm hoping is when I go to her, her city in Tip City. And, um, hopefully I, uh, she'll talk to me. Um, then again, she might shoot me. So, I don't know. Um, but uh, I'm going to her town, and I, I believe that Tip City needs to know exactly who she is, what she is. Um, I, a young lady come by today, took some posters from me to go post in Tip City. Um, like I said, this is about Mackenzie, and that's our main thing. This is about Mackenzie. This ain't about me. This ain't about me being a hero. Um, I'm not a hero. I'm a father. Um, this is about my baby, my baby, because that's what she was, a baby. Um, this is what it's about. It's about Mackenzie. And once we get justice of Mackenzie, we can move forward on making sure that we get justice for all children, um, the right way. And that we make these agencies do the jobs that they're supposed to do and not make the mistakes again. Um, that's Mackenzie's goal. Mackenzie wants everyone to learn from her. Um, what happened to her, what didn't they do, um, what we can do to change things, 
uh, Mackenzie loved, loved ba I mean, I've showed photographs and Mackenzie always was holding one of her younger brothers. Cause I have seven kids totally. And out of the seven kids, Mackenzie held, um, Harrison, Douglas, Cody. Um, so she held a lot of babies. She, she was a, she was a great kid. Uh, great daughter. Awesome daughter. And, uh, so, uh, this is about her. This is about Mackenzie. This ain't about anything else. This ain't about money. This ain't about, uh, uh, who hates me because I did what I do. Um, this is about Mackenzie. That's what matters, and that's what's going to matter. Let me out. And like I said, our pocket. main goal is, we go tell her Douglas is off work. So our main thing is um, justice for my daughter. Um, there's a lot of, I've got uh, smaller kids that are growing and, and they see the picture of Mackenzie and they always ask, you know, who is that and, and everything. So um, it, and it affects them even though they didn't know her. They know that that child was a part of my life and that it was their sister. So um, I thank everybody tonight for um, coming into this and everything. Um, I appreciate the hearts for Mackenzie. I know she does. Um, all I can say is, man, the main thing, if you could do one thing for me, uh, this community is, uh, take the time right now when you log off with me and walk into your child's bedroom and kiss them and, and just give them the biggest kiss you can and tell them you love your child. Um, Mackenzie would love that. She would love to see more parents uh, enjoy the the way we should enjoy our children, and um, I I I thank everybody. I I do. I thank everybody, and I thank this lady here. I thank the gentleman that came forward now, and I think I got enough now to push um, a lot stronger, and uh, I now I have questions to ask, and uh, I want answers, and I think I deserve those answers. So, God bless everybody. I love you all. And um, thank you for supporting McKenzie.